Life can be written by no one, but if there is something astonishing science can do, it is written. By only taking one hair from your head, we can track your origins, identify your relatives, and even detect health issues. This is just a fraction of the extraordinary information that DNA contains. But when did we actually acquire the ability to read DNA? It definitely wasn't an easy way. At first, DNA was just another molecule. No one was aware of its relevance, so it didn't receive much attention. Everything changed in 1944, when Oswald Avery published a paper demonstrating that DNA contains the hereditary units, lately named as genes. Afterwards, Chargaff performed some biochemical analyses that were crucial to understand its composition, and not so long after, Franklin, Watson and Crick elucidated its double helical assembly. As you can see, by the 50s, science was already capable of determining DNA's role, content, and structure. Despite that, the ability to read DNA was still seen as no more than an impossible dream for everyone. Everyone except Frederick Sanger. Back then, the German scientists had already won the Nobel Prize for determining a protein sequence, so he was very eager to discover how to read nucleotides. He became especially interested in one research group who managed to sequence the very particular DNA extremes of virus by using an extension method with a DNA polymerase one. He already could see that this new perspective, once refined, could be worthy of a second Nobel Prize. So he took that primitive idea and planned to transform it into a more standard technique, the so-called plus and minus sequencing. Here is the thing. When the DNA polymerase is in the presence of regular and some radioactive nucleotides, a primer and a sequence, the complementary strand is synthesized and marked. Yet, if the DNA polymerase is under poor chemical conditions, marked fragments of several lengths are going to be obtained instead. And then, this reacting product can be split into different fractions in order to receive different treatments. Plus vessels will get a single nucleotide in this example they made, producing that all the incomplete fragments get filled until the last base is this one. In contrast, minus vessels will get the other three nucleotides. Then, the synthesis would stop exactly before the appearance of the corresponding lucky nucleotide. By making these reactions in all fractions, we would obtain all possible lengths in the sequence. The fragments belonging to each fraction can be identified by using a separation method, such as an electrophoresis. The reason why we make plus and minus reactions is due to the dependence of generating fragments of different lengths in the first place. Some of the bands will not be completely visible. By using the two methods, we could be able to make a double check. However, the life of the plus and minus method was not very long and another much more accurate and simple technique ideated by Maxim and Gilbert, aka the chemical method, took its place. This new approach used a digestion-specific strategy. First of all, the molecule needs to be marked by substituting a regular phosphate group created by a phosphorylase with a radioactive one added by a kinase. The resulting sample is divided into four fractions, and each of them is treated with different chemicals in order to target the digestion of different phases dimethyl sulfate, formic acid, hydrazine, and hydrazine in the presence of a salt. The digestion will occur randomly at different positions, producing fragments of different lengths. Once all the treatments have been done, an electrophoresis separation process can be performed, and the results intuitively read to consequently define our original sequence. After the success of the Maxim and Gilbert method, Sanger didn't lose its own, and develop a new, much more refined extension method, the still today popular Sanger sequencing technique. For this case, the primer that you use is already marked with, for example, radiation. Then, you add a DNA polymerase and a mix of all the four deoxynucleotides as well as one type of the deoxynucleotide, in this case, the deoxythymidine. Then, the synthesis reaction will take place, and all the molecules be added until one dideoxynucleotide is included. Once this happens, the DNA polymerase could get confused due to the lack of an essential hydroxy group and would be incapable of extending their reaction. 
However, the deoxynucleotide's addition can randomly occur at any of the corresponding positions, generating different length fragments. If we do this process using different dideoxynucleotides in different fractions, we can then separate them in an agarose gel, making the shortest fragments move farther in it and easily identifying the sequence of the complementary strand that has been synthesized. The method was soon implemented all around the world, and still today many labs use it with some minor improvements. First of all, they use a TAC polymerase instead of DNA polymerase one, because in many cases we make sure that the reaction takes place at higher temperatures and at higher speed. Also, radiation has been substituted by fluorescently marked dideoxynucleotides with four distinguishable colors associated. For that reason, we do not require to prepare four different fractions, we can load an unix mix in a small capillary to perform the electrophoresis. Then, the combination of a laser and a sensor could reveal the distinct bands and a software program will easily register the data and reconstruct the original sequence. But even this updated Sanger method is not really used nowadays for sequencing large quantities of data, such as a genome. Considering its cost, it would take more than one million dollars to read one human DNA sample. What do we use then? Well, that is something that you will see in the next video. Thank you for your attention, for always being here, and being always.